Hello and welcome to another special edition of Two Mr P's uh, in a podcast with me, Mr P. And the other Mr P. And we are back with another one of our Chinwag sessions and we are delighted to welcome our first international guest from the other side of the pond, YouTube sensation, school principal and author of Go See the Principal, Two True Tales from the School Trenches, Mr Jerry Brooks. Welcome Jerry, how are you doing? Oh, excellent. I'm, I'm so absolutely thrilled to be able to speak with you guys. And so um, I'm very excited about today. Thank you so much for having me. No, no, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, we're just so pleased that you can join us on the UK's number one comedy education podcast. We try and say these things to make it as niche as possible so we can be uh, be number one. Uh, <laughs> they do say, love that. <laughs> yeah. We do say it's the one educational podcast where you won't actually learn anything, but um, <laughs> we, we shall see. So uh, it's been I'm, known that you it's been known that you learn you, you what is it you de learn you unlearn podcast. <laughs> yeah, you, you come away yeah knowing less really. So um, so yeah, so obviously absolutely delighted to have you with us, um, and you've had. I mean, I'm sure most people listening to this will be aware of you and your online videos, which have been un unbelievable. I've been following you for a couple of years. Your content is is spot on, uh, even on even in in the UK. Um, just the other day, one of the we have a like podcast group on Facebook, and one of the teachers mm -hmm. shared the uh, old math v new math little video yeah. that you made, which I think yeah, absolutely. Well. Um, so talk us through this journey of your your viral becoming a sort of teaching viral sensation. Where did it all all start? Where did the inspiration come from? Right. Well, it was it was all an accident. Um, uh, I put up a video. Uh, I started videos with my own personal staff. They were very stressed about state testing, um, which we have here in the United States, and and they just got really stressed with it. And so I did a couple of humorous videos and sent it out to them. And I just continued to do it over the summer. And then in December, um, I did a, a put up a, vi a video of what principals do um, over spring break, a uh, Christmas break, where I was in the building by myself and I was reading and doing the hula hoops and just some silly things. And I put it up on my Facebook page and it ended up getting about 10,000 views. And so I just thought, hey, you know, why don't I continue to do this? And so after about two weeks, I, I maxed out my friends on uh, on Facebook and went to a personal a personality page, and just continued um, to put those up there, focusing it on the craziness that we deal with on a day to day basis. People ask all the time, "Where do you get your ideas?" It's I just show up for work, and that's where that come from. Um, and so it just amassed over four years. I had about two point five million followers um, on all the social media from TikTok, Twitter, um, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, and it's just blown up because what happens here in the United States, as you said, happens in the UK, happens in Canada, happens everywhere. And so whenever we have an issue with a parent or we have a bus issue or we have a child that's, you know, refusing to come off the recess field, you guys are going through that too. Um, and so putting those videos up there has really gained following of the idea that when I'm putting stuff like that out there, somebody says, oh my gosh, it's like you were at my school today. So it's just been great. To be able to have a platform and it's just grown exponentially um bigger than i ever thought it would yeah yeah absolutely and um no it is i mean it is you know there's so many elements of being a teacher that are just so universal like obviously each country have their own little unique vocabulary and you know um what you know some of the things that we do in england will be slightly different but generally speaking it's just so sort of um universal which is which makes it just uh, amazing did you I mean, what, what was it? What, when was the point where you realized, flipping it, this, is, this has gone huge? Was it one particular video that really blew up or was it just a build up over time? Well, that video, um, I, it, it just it surprised me. You know, I had put a video up uh, probably about two weeks beforehand and it got 900 views. And I actually have a text message that I sent to my kids saying, um, just to let you guys know, if I stop texting you, I've gone viral. And so, you know, I may not be able to talk to you guys anymore. And it was at seven. And then all of a sudden I have a video at 10,000. So really and truly that very first one um, uh, on what principals do over snow days um, just surprised me because I thought, oh my gosh. And then what happened is, as you see, especially like on TikTok, people start duplicating what it was. And so all of a sudden now, all of these other videos about what principals do or what teachers do over break started pouring in. Um, and it just kind of, again, just kind of exploded from there. 
Um, Facebook has changed a lot. It used to be really easy to get a million view video up there. Um, and the anal analytics have changed a lot. Um, but it's still just amazing to me when I put a video up there, the comments and the relationships I'm able to form because they're really truly saying that's exactly what happened. I love talking to the DOE people, Department of Education. You know, I've got friends in Guam, people in Japan, and they all say just what you said. Sometimes the vocabulary is different. Sometimes the curriculum is different, but it's all the same in education. Yeah, yeah. I think Lee, you can't really see Lee's arms there, but I'm sure he's making notes because he'd love the uh, amount of views that you pull in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's crazy, and it really is. It's changed a lot, but my, uh, you know, I um, uh, it it'll, it it comes and goes. The COVID, um, uh, my videos for COVID were getting seven, eight, nine, ten million. Um, it was the largest. It's now the largest one beyond a series that I did on the Grinch, um, dressing up as a Grinch. Um, because everybody in the world was dealing with COVID. And when yeah. we talk COVID staff meeting and we talk about Zoom teaching, um, everybody in the world can relate to that. So those COVID videos, I think probably the lowest one is about 6 million and the highest one is about 10 million because everybody could relate to what we were going through here in Kentucky. It's exactly the same thing you guys were going through and everybody was going through everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I was just about to ask that, like the uh, the Corona staff meeting video, which I think was around about March that you, you put that one out. Yeah, uh, put it out yeah. in March right away. Um, uh, it's you know that's one of the things that I really try to do is try to stay as current as possible. Um, they actually put it up. Uh, I say they. I have a um, a friend that works with me on this. He said let's put that up again. Uh, it was at seven million when we put it up, and it got another three hundred thousand views, which very rarely yeah. does. Repeat, but you know, just talked about. Um, you know, what we're going through on a Corona staff meeting, getting all together, gathering all together, the, the teacher's thought process of what's happening. Um, so because it was just really relatable to teachers, it, it really blew up. Yeah, so I was, I was going to ask, uh, how's it been uh, in it, where you are with, with dealing with COVID and being in school? Am I right, you've got the children in school at the minute or are they uh, remote? We do, we do, yeah, we do not. It's, it's just been crazy here in the United States. Um, you know, all of my events got canceled because I, you know, go out and, uh, and we were just getting ready. Probably about 55 events, live events got canceled. But in the past, uh, probably about past six or seven weeks, I was able to go to certain areas that were not having any COVID issues. And so I was in North Dakota. Uh, nobody was wearing a mask. Everything was fine. Well, here, six weeks later, North Dakota is overrun with it. And so it's crazy here. My district, uh, we have about 32,000 kids. Um, 36 elementary schools. Uh, they have changed plans three times now. Um, right now we are on um, uh, virtual. Everybody is completely virtual. They have now gone back into targeted learning, which is where they're bringing in very small groups of kids, speech kids, some intervention kids. Um, and they were going to go back um, just this week. And they voted two weeks ago to go back in full in person in January. So right now my district is completely um, uh zoom the district over from me which is 12 miles is completely in person um that's what we're dealing with here um there's no continuity between cities i was in that district for seven years all those teachers are in all those kids are in um and and then right here in my district real big we're all um uh, doing virtual learning so what are you guys doing right now uh we so when we started back in september it was just all the children in um and it's just been a case of if there's a positive uh, test within your, so we've done it in bubbles. So either each class or each year group are kept in their bubble. Um, and there's been a lot of bubbles bursting. So if one child or a teacher gets a positive test, the whole class or the whole bubble just isolates for 14 days, um, uh, which then makes everything go online if right. the uh, capa uh, capacity to do that. It's weird, isn't it? Because when you're a child, you love bubbles and you just love bubbles popping. <laughs> As an adult, with these bubbles, yeah. it's not that much fun because it's just yeah. things just change just so quickly. One day, you know, it's like for myself, I cover, um, you know, all the PE lessons. One day I'll have a full day of PE, then suddenly pop, pop, pop. And the next day, you know, I've got no one else left to kind yeah. of... Uh, Gosh. So it is, it's, it's, it's insane at the minute. Yeah, yeah. Now, are you having a lot of cases, a lot, of, a lot of kids that are getting it, a lot of teachers that are getting it? Yeah, I mean, in our area, in the Northwest, it's been, uh, it's been pretty bad with, um, I mean, we've, we've been, we've started doing tears in England. 
Um, I mean, everyone's in tears, it seems, but yeah, I've been put in tears. So where we are in the Northwest, we're in the work like tier three, which is the worst one. But the prime minister has just announced that we're going on another lockdown. So we're having four weeks, complete lockdown, whole country wow. apart from the schools. So the schools are staying open. So it's uh, a bit of a tricky one because it feels like the virus is spreading in schools, um, right. colleges, universities, but um, <clears throat> we know that that's the best place for the children to be in a way because it's a safe place for them to be. You know, they're getting the education, but because, uh, you know, it's quite difficult in certain areas where we are of making sure that children have access to the technology. I'm sure it's a similar where you Absolutely. must be, there'll be certain families that might not have access to the technology. So remote learning can be amazing, but it's hard to ensure everyone's able to access it. Um, and, the, and the government sort of get, uh, said to schools that they were going to send a load of laptops to try and support children, mm. parents who might not be able to afford it. And then literally a week, we've just had half term, we've just had a week off. And the Friday night, as we broke up, the government sent an email to everyone saying, no, you're not getting what we said. You can get like, right. so instead of getting 50, you can have four. So it's just, it's just a really tough, just yeah. trying to manage yeah. it. And we're dealing with the, um, you know, the issue, the, the social media issue of people, you know, parents, they're all stressed. They want to be back in school. And then they're starting to blame teachers and saying, you guys don't want to work. You're just being lazy. And, you know, our teachers are working more now and working harder than they've ever worked before. So it's it's a very difficult situation all the way around, just with perceptions, with the stress parents are having, of all of a sudden they've got kids home and don't know what to do with them, yeah. even with teachers who have kids. So it's, it's just been crazy. Who, who in the world would have thought that we were going to end up in this situation and could very well be into a year in March in, in this craziness? Yeah, and I mean, it, where we are, it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon because... Yeah. Yeah, we've just not got a test and trace <clears throat> system in place. And yeah, it's, it's an absolute it's, it's, it's crazy, though, when you look back. I mean, you know, when it started in March, it was my birthday in October. It's my wife's birthday a couple of days ago. And we were saying, like, when it happened in March, we were like, oh, well, the next night out or the next thing we can do will be our birthdays. And it's kind of got to our birthdays now. And um, it feels like it's a restart. It just feels like it's happening again. Um, mm -hmm. but it's not as exciting this time around. The first lockdown, because the weather was okay, it was kind of a bit like, oh, this is different. This is new. Yeah. We get to spend time in the garden and whatever. Now the weather's miserable, and I have to spend all day with my own kids, and I'm just like, no, no, no. I prefer no, to spend not, it with 30 really. others that I uh, work with. And the idea that, that we didn't know what it was, I remember when it, we first got locked down thinking we were going to be back in school in two weeks. And then we're going to be back in school in a month. And my son um, uh, had his wedding in May. And so, you know, we were out in March and I thought, okay, we'll be back in April. We'll be back the first of here, you know, and they ended up having to cancel that. Um, and they just did it last two weeks ago, still under lockdown. So I, it's been craziness. It really has been. But I continue to tell everybody whenever I'm speaking virtually or doing a conference that there is no better people to be able to handle this than educators because oh, yeah. we have passionate about what we do and we want the kids to be successful and so while it has been stressful I have been amazed at the way teachers have stepped up and done something that they were not used to not trained had no clue how to do it but yet here we are providing as high quality education as we can there's there's no better people to get through this than educators I have to agree with you I, I've said it leads, I said it this morning I was at a school doing some training this morning I was saying like I've never been more proud to call myself a teacher seeing how teachers have been able to step up i mean in england we had one day we got told on the thursday that schools were going to close on the friday mm. and just within that day schools were able to get certain things in place for vulnerable families so we didn't close completely it was just majority of our children would be learning from home and then mm. obviously if the parents were key workers worked in the health service or were you know worked within certain shops whatever it might be then they would still come in so for schools to have a day to t make that turnaround and for teachers who you know for years have been apprehensive of technology who haven't felt as confident with technology to be able to step up and sort of embrace it to ensure they're providing as much as they possibly can do for the children you're absolutely spot on it's been it's been unbelievable
they're my favorite uh they're my favorite online teachers the ones that aren't too good with technology and you end they end up doing the zooms like this close to the camera <laughs> and it's, uh, you know they're so close you can see inside the nostrils just just move a little bit back there miss cheers <laughs> well, one of the things that amazes me is the relationships that have been built between younger generation teachers and older generation teachers because we have this mindset that when a new teacher first second third year comes in they hook on to the older generation because they know it well now you've got the opposite you got 25 year veteran teachers who don't know technology don't know how to set these things up and and all of a sudden there's this great relationship and so there have been a lot of positives that have come out of this that people i think don't recognize and they will recognize but i think that's one of the amazing things is you've got older teachers relying on younger technologically savvy um, uh, te teachers as opposed to the other way around where you're getting put with a mentor that's been there for 25 years it's kind of like the opposite of that so there's some good coming up yeah um so we were laughing just before you came on because we've been watching a couple of your videos and um what was it was it the video about the parent who didn't want the temperature being taken with a gun yeah i mean literally they they felt like it was going to scramble the child's brain and you know, we all know parents that are like that that, that you know they are but that that just amazes me and again that's what we deal with and the best part about that is people don't think they're true you know 95 percent of the things that i put up on on um, social media are true and people that are not in education i mean you all laugh at that but you know good and well that that easily could have been a parent at your school too yeah just what we deal with <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like the parent that made that complaint has clearly had her temperature checked an awful lot <laughs> And it's just the whole thing is just absolutely crazy. And for them to want to figure out if we can take temperatures under the arm or down below, and I'm like, do you really think that's what we're going to do uh, in any way, shape, or form? I mean, we don't even touch a child, much less something that way. So that's, that's <laughs> on a regular basis, every single school everywhere is dealing with that craziness. That was brilliant. Yeah, there was one. There was a one that I saw before um, when you said about the parent ringing up and saying, my child hasn't come home on the bus today. And then you, you said, well, they're on the virtual learning program. So if you check the bedroom. <laughs> yeah, and, and that literally that happened. We, my child never got off the bus. And I'm like, you know what? Your child is at home. Did you check your bedroom because they're sleeping? It's been four days. You know, they've not been, it, yeah, again, that just absolutely. And then of course we get blamed for it. We get blamed all the time. My child didn't get off the bus. Well, it's because he went three doors down to go play with his friend because yeah. his friend better snacks than you have if you had good snacks <laughs> like the bus in there but that's just again it's just what we deal with on a regular basis <laughs> yeah i mean we have a, we have a feature on the podcast which is like weird interactions with parents and um yeah some of the stories we've had have been have been great but yeah some of those were, were brilliant i mean do you have i mean it's a big thing at the minute the sort of like you were saying where people are thinking everything they see on social media is 100 percent true i mean we've had a the odd sort of um sort of conspiracy theorist parent and we had the, there was a letter going around at the beginning of the year about sort of not taking temperature have you had what, have you had any do you get much of that or is it just the odd one well no we get a lot of that we get, and we have teachers we have crazy teachers um i don't have the one that's really crazy but we do um that will send out conspiracy theories and this is what's happening and aliens are coming down and and the teacher that's a whole different story but we have <laughs> Here, you know, we're getting ready to go through election in two yeah. days. And so you've got this, this constant craziness and you've got one group that really does jump into this conspiracy theory. Um, so it's absolutely crazy. We have arguments nonstop about masks that we're having people scream and yell because of the differences of opinions here. Yeah. And some of the ideas that they come up with, uh, it, it's just absolutely crazy. And then, you know, and I'm sure that those on the other side probably think that we're crazy because we don't believe in them. But, uh, you know, the, the people that we deal with and the belief system they have are so out there sometimes that, it again, it makes our day, though. That's what makes our day fun. What in the world is going to happen today at school with one of these crazy parents or one of the crazy kids or, or teachers? It, it's, it's what makes our days go by. So, yeah, I saw um, I saw a, a, a woman on my Facebook who who's a parent at my old school. So I don't work with her children anymore. I think they're a bit older. But she shared something. Do you remember the first Monsters Inc. film where a monster would get like a child's sock on the back and then they'd come and they'd shave the monster uh, down yeah. and take the monster out? 
she put that on Facebook and said, this is what will happen if your child has a high temperature in school, <laughs> that someone will come in and extract them and put them in a room. And I was honestly like, how can anyone believe this? I mean, she's obviously having a temperature. regularly <laughs> scrambling yeah. a brain. We had a parent that swore that she, that they had put a recording device under their child's skin. <laughs> I, I promise you, this was probably seven years ago, that put a recording device under the child's skin so that they could record what was going on in the parent's classroom. I mean, who in the world, it, it just absolutely amazes me. And again, that's what we deal with. All that crazy that you see out on social media when you know and even we see it with some of the stars when when some celebrity goes off and and is crazy well that's what we deal with we deal with it on a regular basis and we just look at them and go oh my gosh did you really just say that but again it's what makes it what, it's what makes our, our job fun that's for sure that's where you have to remain professional when they say something like so absurd you just kind of like I'll take that on board. Uh, we'll get back to you when you, and then you go back in the staff room like, oh my God, you won't believe what they've just said. Uh, it's difficult de dealing with it. And you sometimes I just look and I just think, I, I don't know what to say on this. So I'm just going to go, okay, so let's move on here because you don't even have a platform. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's, let's just, so talk us, uh, well, let's go back to the very, very start. What was it that made you choose a career? In, in education? Yeah, well, I, I'm one of those ones that knew from early on, um, uh, and, and I, I do think a lot of people realize that. They say I knew early on, but, um, you know, everything that I did growing up was always dealing with kids, uh, babysitting, lifeguarding, uh, doing summer camps, um, everything. I felt like that was a giftedness that I had and I enjoyed, and so growing up through middle school and high school and college, everything was always centered around a job that was that and a combination of leadership. Um, my dad was a PE teacher, um, and so, I, you know, you kind of grew up that way. So I'm really one of those ones that could easily say, I, you know, I knew all along that that's what I wanted to do. Um, you know, when I got into teaching, I think one of the things that we always need to think about, and, and like you guys, as young as you are, where you are most effective. Um, and so I started out in the classroom. I did 14 years in the classroom, and I realized um, that I'm affecting 25 kids, and I love this but I could affect 700 kids if I moved into administration. And so for me, um, you know, I felt like I had that talent of working with kids and leadership. Um, and so it just swung to the idea that now I can be in charge of a school and I can support teachers. And while I'm not in the classroom supporting those kids on a, you know, at six hours a day, I'm supporting the teachers who are supporting those. So it's just kind of been a um, transition to be able to say, I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher and I had natural leadership skills. Um, and so it just kind of progressed into love teaching, love this, love the education system. You know, now let's move into intervention. Now let's move into curriculum specialists. And now let's move into administration, um, uh, just in, in where your effectiveness is and where your, um, your leadership abilities and your talents lie. Yeah. So how long have you, so you're teaching for 14 years. How long have you now been a principal is it? I did four, 14 years um, in a, uh, 13 years in the classroom and 12 years in administration. Oh, my, amazing. Yeah. And um, Long -term. what what's your definition of leadership? What would you say makes a good leader? Well, I think what makes a good leader is someone that's there that realizes that they aren't in charge. Um, I'm not in charge of my school. It cracks me up when people say I am. It, it's the teachers that are in charge. Um, my job as administrator, I think all administrators, is to support the teachers. Um, and uh, when I have a decision to be made, uh, they are the ones that make the decision for me because they know best. You're in the classroom. You're in the you know you're in the gym for PE. You know what's going on. You know where money needs to be spent. You know all that. And so um, administrators, I think their job is to support teachers. Um, they're supporting teachers through their parent issues, uh, financially through behavior issues. Um, uh, I, you know, the, I think the struggling leaders are the ones that think they're in charge of the school and want to make every decision and then tell everybody what is going to happen. Um, I think a good leader, you know, really and truly realizes that you're there to support the people in the building through supporting parents, through discipline, through finance and budgeting. Um, and then the teachers are happy and it makes for a happy place to work. We have a, um, we have, well, that, that, I want to applaud you on that. That sounds absolutely perfect. I think everyone should be listening to that. We have a feature on the podcast called Diabolical Leader of the Week. 
Uh, you would firmly never be in this section, <laughs> from the sounds of it. Um, but it's like teachers all kind of anonymously <clears throat> let us know what their leadership's like, and and we kind of kind of share the, the craziness. What was the one, Lee? I wanted you to share with Jerry. What was the one where the the teacher got mocked on her size? Wasn't it her that her figure? Oh yeah. Oh, what was it? The head teacher only hired uh, oh, yeah, size yeah, yeah. ten or below, wasn't it? Yeah, this this head teacher got a uh, reputation because he would only ever hire teachers who were, you know, uh, wow. easy on the eye, so to speak. Well, I can tell you that I also know someone here that does that. Really? Uh, this, this person has a reputation of going to visit um, student teachers to observe student teachers before he's going to hire them. So he'll spend three or four days going to go observe the college uh, teachers and, and watching them. But I mean, can you imagine that? That that's the reputation. And, and it, yeah, it just amazes me. And I'm forward with that. Whenever I put something on, you know, people will say, I wish I worked for you. Let me tell you, um, you know, and when you follow people like Teacher Misery on Instagram and you see all these catastrophes that are happening at schools i just think how in the world are these people keeping their jobs yeah. and how are their teachers not running out the door because there's some crazy some i need to listen to that because that's going to be for some good videos for sure yeah this this there's all sorts i mean i i get i get told a lot of the time that i'm quite anti sort of leadership in schools and i always say i'm not i'm not you know i think majority of leaders are absolutely amazing uh just like you've described they're there to support the staff I'm very much just sort of anti-bad practice. So if I see something happening in the school that I just don't agree with, or I'll just question the why, like what impact is that gonna have on, on teaching? Because in England, I don't know if it's the same in America, we've got this obsession in education of trying to make everything as complicated and seem as busy mm -hmm. as possible. Whereas I sort of go, hang on a second, if that's not gonna have impact on the children's learning, why do we need to do it? And then people sort of can get the back up there because they think I'm having a go at them. And it's not, they want the best, but it's just how they go about doing it. Sometimes it can be just creating so much faff, which then adds to teachers' workload. And it just then Absolutely. has an impact on the quality of teaching and learning. Because if the teachers, you know, aren't well rested, if they're, you know, staying up till whatever time and they're tired and they're run down, they're not going to be as effective in the classroom. So it's, you know it's that that's my focus of a lot of what i talk about is look how can we how can we use technology to make our lives easier so going again back to the home learning and everything that's happened there i think one of the biggest uh positives is that when lockdown actually happened so much of this faff that teachers are normally consumed with of you know having to prove that they're doing this observation right. book, book scrutiny so, that all suddenly stopped and what teachers had was they had the time to say oh we'll learn how to use zoom and i will learn how to use google classroom mm -hmm. and what we've got to make sure we then do is sort of build on that this year is sort of carry on building on what teachers have innovated and 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 learn and not then let these bad habits sort of creep back in yeah absolutely well we um i you know i have a reputation within our central office that if i don't think it's beneficial i don't do it yeah. and I get a lot of trouble in, in for that if you know they say this is what we need to do i'll be like you know I, i'm gonna wait until you absolutely tell me it's a mandate but don't give me a good idea or a suggestion because if you give me what you think is a suggestion and it's now going to add work to my staff we're not going to do it yeah. and it's something that like you said is not going to affect learning positively with students um we will do it to the least that we can do to be able to check the box off but I, you know, I'm not going to have my teachers do overwhelming things, turn in all this stuff that's really just busy work that yeah. makes when at central office feel like they're doing their job when that's just overwhelming for them. So I kind of have a reputation with central office to be able to say, I'll do what you want me to do. However, if it's not affecting learning, we are going to do it just to check off the box and get on with it because yeah. teachers are overwhelmed as it is. So is central office like the equivalent to Ofsted? Well, um, the way, and you said head teacher. We don't have head teachers. So each school uh, has a principal. If they're larger schools, sometimes they'll have an assistant principal or an academic dean. And then um, all of our areas have a district office. So um, my, you know, we have 36 elementary schools, 10 high schools, eight middle schools, and we have a central office. And that's the superintendent. There are three elementary um, uh, directors, and they're in charge of 10 schools. There's a, two middle school directors, a high school. So it's like 
uh, you know, it's just a hierarchy um, that comes down. And so central office will come in and say, this is what the elementaries need to do. And then we have big meetings with them. I have one that deals with me and 10 other, it's called a cadre, 10 schools are in our cadre. Um, and so it's, it's the hierarchy of central office, then the schools, um, uh, and just in trying to get things done. And you all have uh, head teachers, is that what you said? Yeah, so our, every school will have a head teacher. Um, we you sometimes get executive head teachers who might be in charge of a couple of schools, and then obviously you'll have deputy head teachers and and, and so on. But in England, it's a little bit different because we then have um, Ofsted, which is sort of like <clears throat> it's like an yeah. inspection team. <laughs> yeah, careful what I say. Here. But it's going, so they 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 will go into schools and they will um, judge schools. Uh, and, and write reports and give them a grade and uh, you can either be unsatisfactory, satisfactory, good or outstanding and that grade is basically what I think creates so much of the workload in England because every school wants to be outstanding and Absolutely. you can get all these people telling you what this this is going to be outstanding, this is going to be outstanding mm. and you end up trying to do everything and it just creates more workload for for teachers i think the best thing they could do is scrap the grading um and just ofsted go into schools and write a report on what the school's doing well and what the school right. needs to improve on but that's not the way it sort of happens there's so much politics that go into it but right. um, i think that's the big issue as to why workloads not necessarily ofsted themselves it's schools who play that game of wanting to be sort of grade, do you know what i mean yeah. Well, on ours, ours, uh, you know, everything for ours is, is based on test scores. It's the same type of thing. They wait until spring when test scores come out. And, uh, you know, we've got areas that are tremendously low income students with parents that are working two jobs. And then we've got areas that, um, you know, the whole school, everybody's in a $400,000, $500,000 house. And so you've got this inequity there. And then, you know, the reputation of the high income schools are they're fantastic schools when in actuality, you've got an unbelievable amount of very dedicated teachers working at the lower income schools. Yeah. Um, and so we have that same type of disparage, uh, disparity, disparity. We don't get graded that way. Some of the states do. Um, they get A, B, C, D, or F. Um, uh, but again, the United States is state to state, but it's all based on state testing, which again, it's, it's ridiculous. And that stress that we go under trying to get to a certain level um, what it does here is it creates professional jealousy and it, it breaks down your ability to grow as a professional because when you become jealous of that school that's excellent, um, you want to reach out to them and, you know, you don't want them to come present to your staff because you're jealous of it. And then all of a sudden you can't grow as a professional. So I think it's, it's very negative, um, that type of um, judging and rating and uh, relying on test scores to say that's what's happening in the school when they don't look at how you dealt with a kid who whose parents are divorced or who's being bullied or whose house burnt down or whose parents don't have a job. Um, you know, they don't look at things like that, which are the most important. They only look at, you know, test scores. Yeah. You know what? It was very, very similar in England with the SATs in primary school. So uh, at the end of the last year of primary school, the children do a set of tests and those results would then trigger, either trigger the Ofsted or mm -hmm. sort of um, very much decide what grade you'd get. Um, but just the last sort of year or so, Offset have changed it now and they're not as, you know, they'll take into account the test scores, but it's more about the broad and balanced curriculum. And because what we've found with the SATs is that they're very narrow in that they can only show a certain side of a child's understanding and you're not getting Absolutely. the full picture. Um, but yeah, that, I suppose that's sort of similar in a way because, you know, the SATs mm -hmm. have been, um, what are they doing this year? Are they scrapping them given everything that's happening or are they can still planning on doing them? Well, no, they scrapped them last year, and um, uh, right now we are doing um, district by district does certain things. We do a universal screener, which is three times a year, um, and so we did our fall universal screener, and all of our kids were distinguished because they did them at home, and all the parents helped them. So we've got all distinguished kids, which is great, um, but right now um, I can't imagine they wouldn't scrap it. Um, we, we didn't have to do it last year, obviously. But I think that if we get into January, February, where we're at, I think the state will completely scrap the testing. Yeah. The, you're already seeing a huge discrepancy. You cannot allow a student to do that assessment at home with a parent standing over them because the way ours work, if you answer three questions correctly, it throws you higher. 
And so all of a sudden this parent has given this child and now you've got a kindergartner doing, you know, triple digit multiplication because the parent helped them on two things. Um, and so I can't imagine that they're not going to go ahead and scrap that um, because it, it's just going to be impossible. Have they scrapped yours? Are you, are you all still doing it or what's going on? At the minute, they're still planning on doing it, but I think um, it's just good. I, I can't see them going because obviously with all the bubbles going, you're going to have, let's say, for example, at my school, my year six bubble hasn't burst. But if at Adam's school they have, that's two weeks where they're not in school. So you can't then, that surely can't be fair to then right. judge all the children in the same way. I mean, they scrapped them last year and, you know, it's not had any sort of negative impact on the children. Or yeah. it's not, you know, it's, 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 it's pointless. It's, you know, the government themselves have come out and said it's purely a, uh, a way of judging schools it's not really for the children but you know I mean I laugh at the when you say it about um you know parents helping the kids I'm, I'm kind of thinking if my kids got tests sent home and I was like right let's get it done I, I don't think I'd be very much help <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what you probably would happen in high school some of them helped and they went backwards instead of with <laughs> for sure <laughs> um so what would you like if I was to ask you the, what is the ultimate goal of education what is your definition of what education should be what do you sort of, what's your sort of go-to motto of, of, of teaching and learning well I think our goal is to is to, um, is to produce successful students um, uh, and and within that realm of successful we're talking about emotionally um, that they can get along with people that they have good relationships that they can handle stress um, physically and health wise um, uh, and also success in life and so if that means a trade school and they're going to be a mechanic if that means uh, you know, doing hair, if that means being a doctor. I mean, I think that we need to take the students where they're at, um, be supportive of the parents and the teachers, and then produce students that are successful. And, you know, unfortunately, the definition of successful, we have to be very careful that we don't allow somebody else to make that, um, uh, that definition for us. Um, you know, to me, successful is a child that can stand on their own as an adult, um, uh, can bring in income and support themselves, um, can have loving, caring relationships and, and be a productive part of society. And so I think our goal in education is to set our students up for success, no matter what route they're on, um, uh, of going on to a career, going on to higher education, not going on there. Um, I think our goal is to be able to set them up for success, starting where they're at and knowing that we want them to be successful and also when they get up there. Love that. Love that. Brilliant. Really good. Um, so just going back to like your social media pages, how do your, I mean, are your parents at your school aware of, because um, we've had a couple of questions of our podcast where people have said, you know, right. uh, how do you, do, do your parents listen, the parents of the children yeah. listen, or, you know, what do yeah. your staff say about your, your, your stories, yeah. your, your videos? And well, um, it's uh, early on, I got called into human resources about two years that I put up there because a parent had uh, anonymously emailed um, complaining that I was bullying teachers um, uh, in two of the videos that I had already shown the, the teachers. Um, and, uh, you know, human resources was very, that's at our central office, the person that's in charge of any kind of struggling that any teachers are having. Um, you know, and they said, we love it, but don't shoot, the, don't shoot them on school property. Um, so, as you know, freedom of speech here, and at least in my area, um, you know, I have a right to be able to do that. And so they were just basically saying, you know, if someone disagrees with something that you've said and you're on school property, then they can call, you know, they can, they can hold us accountable because you're representing the school. But when you are at home or, you know, I'm in my car all the time, that's why um, it's your freedom of choice. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm very intelligent about it. I never put a video up that can be traced to a specific child would never say, you know, when I say something that could be deemed negative, um, like about central office or something, it's never about my uh, you know, it, it, first of all, if it's about my district only, then then the two million people that are watching don't understand it. Yeah, so yeah. when I'm coming up on social media, um, it never tracks back down to me um, because what's happening is someone's either said it or it's all three there. So the central offices have been supportive because they also know I have a platform like you guys do. Um, you know, I can go on and be very supportive of is issues. They know the stress the teachers go through. So they're supportive of that. Parents tend to love it kids follow it. Um, you know, I've probably had the same issues of you guys, whenever someone disagrees with something, controversial issues, that that one on new math versus old math, Lord, I can't believe how controversial, how, how controversial that was. You know, parents don't understand, 
and I was not really, you know, I, it, it, teachers thought I was bad mouthing new math. Parents, <laughs> why do we do this? Um, you know, there's always a video up there, and every video, just like you guys have, every single thing you say, there's somebody that doesn't like it. Um, but my thought process is, is I'm, as long as I'm trying to support teachers, support education, not tearing anybody down. Um, and even when I do something about principals having, you know, staff meetings that are too long or, you know, principals being judgmental, um, I'm not tearing down the principals. I'm building up the teachers to say, we're all dealing with this, support each other. Um, and so I always see it as a supportive thing, even when it's something that might be a little bit controversial. It's, it's always supporting teachers in a humorous way in the things that we deal with. But, you know, some people don't like it. I found the majority of parents have been very supportive since your office has been supportive. Um, and I'm sure like you guys, that they know your heart. And that's what I find if someone knows your heart and they know that you're not trying to be deceptive, you're not trying to be um, uh, negative, um, then something might come out. But generally, they're very supportive. I, I mean, I know that I know that Lee will bring up something that happened to him recently. But I just wanted to say, from my point of view, obviously we started this, this podcast. Lee was, you know, is one of the, the most followed teacher in the UK on social media. So he was a look at him. I mean, he loves it. Uh, he was like, you know, a bit of a. He was getting a bit of a bit of fame, a little bit. You know, he was he was up to like the Y list or the X list, something like that. Um, and. You know, for me, I was just working in schools, and then we started this podcast after a after a holiday to America, actually. Um, and then I always remember I told I told this story about my dodgeball team winning this tournament, and it was a great story about this girl who couldn't really catch; she could never really catch, but she ended up catching the crucial ball. And anyway, I retold this story, and it was years; it was about a year or two after uh, the girl had left the school. And then the mum came up to me and said, uh, oh, I'm uh, I'm Mary's mum. You know, Mary, you had a couple of years ago. I said, yeah, yeah. And she said, uh, she listens to your podcast that you do, your brother. I said, all right. She was like, yeah, she she ran home really excited the other day because she, uh, she said that you spoke about her. And I was like, I can assure you I never use names or anything. She went, no, she was the girl who can't catch at dodgeball. And I was like, oh, uh, yeah. how awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, you got to be careful if something happens. And sometimes... The you know the thing with the the, the thermometer. I thought you know someone's going to call down on that, but Lord, that's worth it. If you're that crazy, then you can be called out like that. But we have to be very careful with that. And it's, yeah. it's too, absolutely busy, crazy. too busy watching the conspiracy theorists to watch your no, your content. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. I think I mean I mean what's great is I think what what I uh, will always put forward is this idea of because I always get asked as well what about your children you know do your pupils follow you on on online and mm -hmm. I mean I always say look the children at my age shouldn't be on social media anyway you yeah. know but if they are I'd rather they follow someone who's being positive and showing how you can use social media in a positive way rather mm -hmm. than following people who can be controversial who can you know it can lead to other stuff and I think you know, it's it's great to have people who are demonstrating that actually social media isn't this bad thing. It can be used for, for good. It can be a really positive tool. And I think, you know, for people like yourself and I'm sure you know, I know there's loads of other people that, you know, it's it's modeling positive use of this tool that ultimately a lot of the children are going to go go on and, and use themselves. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's the big key is that, you know, I have people, you know, I, I'm floored watching TikTok. I, you know, TikTok for me, um, I don't really like it, but it's enabled me to build relationships with middle school and high school teachers because a lot of it is middle school and high school and older students. Um, but I am amazed at some of the things people put out on TikTok. Uh, you know, I'm thinking you were right there says you're a teacher and you've just used inappropriate words or that dance that you were doing is horrendous. <laughs> Think that you know we need to be held accountable for our social media knowing that we are uh you know we are the spotlight of kids um and that's that you know that's one of the reasons why i absolutely love it and why i love that i have so many followers because i know i'm not going to use bad language i'm not going to give into the idea you know even po politics i never put up anything political because it's it's a going back and forth and if um, you know i don't it doesn't bother me when someone jumps on me on social media like i didn't like that what bothers me is when they start arguing with each other um, and just delete them. I, I'll d delete people out of my page and delete comments because I don't want kids to see that. I don't want adults to see that. I don't want to be there any controversy. 
I think that what we need to be doing is supporting each other, supporting educators, showing kids that things can be humorous, showing educators that the stress that we're going through can, there's humor in that. And most importantly, it's a camaraderie because when I put something that's funny, you can relate to it. You know that across the pond, as you said, somebody's going through the exact same thing um, and it can be very negative. You just got to watch yourself and make sure you're always positive. Absolutely. Spot on. So, um, I mean, you have a great sense of humor with all the videos that you, you, you do post. And as you say, you show a real appreciation for the hard work that teachers do. So as, as a sort of administrator, as a, as a principal, what, how, how best do you go about motivating your staff? How do you, you know, make sure that, you know, they're doing the job to the best of their ability? Right. Well, it's all about climate and culture. That's what I always speak about whenever I'm out speaking is climate and culture. And, and climate and culture is the relationships that you build with people that you're working with. Um, what I have found is when you build relationships with the teachers, um, they take that example and want to build relationships with the kids and with the parents and everything falls in place. And so, um, you know, I can support someone and teach them how to teach a curriculum that needs to be given to the kids, but I can't teach them how to be respectful to each other and uh, how to get along. I can only model that. So we do a whole lot of fun activities. Uh, uh, just, you know, you see them all throughout the videos, goodie table days and 100 days of school where we dress up, ABC days where everybody dresses up as a letter. Um, uh, we celebrate things with people's children. You know, if your child gets an award, if your child, you know, scored the winning, um, you know, dodgeball uh, point, um, we celebrate that at staff meetings. Um, because to me, I think the, the climate and culture is based on those teachers getting along and supporting each other in not only their job, but in their lives. And when you build this camaraderie on a great level and within a school, then the rest of it comes along because people want to be supportive. They reach out to each other. Um, and so I think it's not about academics. It's not about how good a teacher is. It's about building relationships so that you can, in turn, be a better teacher because you've got a great relationship with somebody that you see is doing good and you just kind of all work together. So to me, it's all about personal climate and culture, those activities, building each other up, building relationships. And, that, and, that, and then that trust, isn't it, to be able to reach out to others if you do find yourself struggling or if you are unsure. And, you know, if people have got that relationship and that closeness, you know, they don't mind see, being seen as vulnerable and being seen that they're not perfect. And I, I think that's a, uh, with, with some teachers, it's this idea that what you see on social media is everyone being amazing at teaching and, you know, very different in reality. But having oh, yeah. that, you know, having that, like I say, camaraderie with your colleagues to be able to say, I'm actually struggling with this. Are you able to help me and not feeling judged or feeling like you're being, yeah, you know, sort of, uh, it, you'll be looked down on yeah. because of it. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's really important. I think, I think spot on again. Um, that's what I, don't, I sort of want to try and work at your school, if I'm honest. Do you have, I bet you don't have much, um, staff turnover then do you get staff no. yeah yeah we don't i have people say all the time i wish i could work with you and i say you're gonna have to run somebody over in the parking lot because people just don't uh we don't have turnover we are spanish immersion school um and so we try to recruit teachers from spain a lot and they are usually there um, for five years and then we kind of replace them in but uh otherwise uh that that's a key and i tell leadership that all the time if you've got a tremendous amount of turnover that's your fault um yeah. Teachers will drive an hour to a school where the administration is supportive. Teachers will stay at a school where the kids are flipping tables and arguing and fighting if the administration is supportive. And so we vary. The only turnover we ever have is when someone moves up to a central office position or a district curriculum position um, because people want to be where there's relationships and where they're supportive and, and where everybody likes each other. And so we very rarely have turnover. And I think that's a that's a, a leadership issue if you have a lot of turnover. Yeah. Completely off uh, off topic from me. Uh, popped into my head. What's kind of like a staff Christmas get together where you all get like jolly well, on we, the old. Uh, uh, an ornament, we do an ornament exchange um, uh, where everybody brings an ornament, wrapped it up, you put a number on it. Uh, and then they, and, and we do a big, big huge um, food. I'll tell you the funniest thing that happened on that. Uh, so my assistant principal um, brought in an ornament and uh, he had taken the ornament off of his tree and it had his wedding date engraved in the back of it <laughs> and gave it to somebody else. Um, uh, so the next year I called him and I said, you know, make sure that you bring an ornament that's bought, that's new. 
And when he came in, I said, bring it to me, I want to see it. And so I saw what his ornament was and he put it on the library table. And when nobody was in there, I snuck in there and got his package and I took it to our family resource, which is where we have food and clothing. And I took his ornament out and I replaced it with a pink bra and I rewrapped it and I put it back on the library table. So when they got to his number, the lady that opened it, opened it up, instead of having his ornament, she pulled out this pink bra and it was like, ah! and again, it's like that, that, you know, they, it's, it's some of the, they remember that, that ornament with the, with his um, wedding date, they put it back in the ornament exchange and for nine years, somebody gets it, has to, you know, watch over it and put it back in the next year. You know, it's those things, it's those traditions, those fun things um, that people still talk about that, you know, you have that no, no other school has. Um, you know, it's all about the relationships. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I, I always say, I think it speaks volumes when you've got a staff. Uh, and it's similar in my school, to be fair. No one ever leaves unless they're moving onwards and upwards. Mm -hmm. um, and I do, because I've, I've been in certain schools, visited schools where they've got staff turnover. Um, you won't you won't believe like one I think there was one school last year where one member of staff in a huge sort of three form entry was, was staying on and I just think right there's obviously something going on there it's obviously not yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I, I'm telling you teachers will stay with a supportive administration and you know, because and here's the deal when I speak you know I always have this block of, of administrators who don't like me they don't think it's humorous I want to say they're jealous I, I hate to say that but you know they really are they get mad when I say things like you shouldn't be having an hour staff meeting after school when your teachers have worked all day long because they do that and they get mad when I say if you have turnover it's because of you and what they want to say is no we're in a rough school we don't have this one but the, the bottom line is is if you as administrator are stepping up supporting teachers building climate culture building relationships that's the place people want to be and I'm, I'm amazed with central office when we have a struggling school and they replace that administration they look for someone who's helping the school academically but they don't look for a, a, an administrator that's building relationships at a school because that change it I, I say all the time um, uh, um, uh, um, test scores don't change relationships relationships change test scores yeah. we have relationships that's when the test scores change it's not the test scores that change the relationships it's the relationship that changes the test scores absolutely absolutely so if i'm right you're based in is it lexington kentucky lexington kentucky yep yeah. so what would you what what would you say it's like going to a elementary school for for children where you are what's what what sort of type of education do they get well, it's, uh, you know, I think that we are producing really strong kids. Um, you know, we struggle in all areas. Uh, the, the biggest United States Lexington thing we deal with is a have and have not and, and a discrepancy between high income and low income. Um, that's probably the biggest struggle that, that the educational system has in the United States here. Um, we have that. We have a, a haves and have nots. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we I feel like we do a great job with that. But you know, our kids come in, they get all five of the, the, the strong um, subject areas with math, science, social studies, reading. Um, we have special classes where they go to computer lab. We actually have a Chinese language program where they go in, um, PE. Um, they rotate around there. We're there seven hours. And so, um, you know, I feel like our kids are getting a great education. Our biggest struggle in the United States is closing what they call closing the gap because you've got high income kids that are here and low income kids that are here. And we want to be able to close that gap and raise our lower struggling students up. And, and we really and truly struggle with that. Unfortunately, COVID has really and truly widened our gap because those kids who have a parent at home, who have internet, who have computers, have really you know, succeeded. Those that don't have gone. So we've got this bigger gap, um, which I'm assuming is the same with you guys too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, it's ex pretty much exactly the same as you've said there. It's, it's, it's always been about sort of closing closing the gap. And like I say, I think COVID's made that more apparent or worsened it in a lot of ways. Absolutely. So yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Sorry, so it's just unbelievable to <clears throat> know just how similar. I mean, when you said about the staff meeting, I mean, I'm sure my brother was like jumping out of his chair because that is one of the things that he, I mean, he does drone on about it but he does he does say about it an awful lot I mean you're completely against that as well aren't you yeah I just think a lot of the time as well it's staff meetings for the Wait. sake of staff meetings and it's like well if it can be done on an email just do it on an email absolutely I mean and that's the thing to me I think it's so disrespectful 
And our central office does this with principals. We have a once a month meeting and I'm sitting in this meeting going, you were just talking so that we can be here and say, there's a meeting. I mean, if you can't, and I, and I said that just the other day when I was uh, uh, teaching, you know, if you can't have a 30 minute staff meeting and get everything that you need in there, then you need to re, uh, uh, reevaluate how you're communicating through email. Um, and you know, sometimes you've got staffs that don't read emails and, and that may be part of it, but I just think it's so disrespectful knowing the work that teachers put in on a day-to-day -day basis, how much they do on a weekend, to all of a sudden say, we're gonna have a 45 minute hour staff meeting afterwards, when I could have emailed that to you on Monday and Tuesday said, did you all hear that and make sure it is? And then gone from there. I, I just think that we are not very respectful of, of teachers' times and the dedication um, that they put in for, for their positions. Absolutely, yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, so from your understanding of sort of, uh, obviously UK schools, what would you say are the sort of biggest differences between the US and the UK from maybe what you see online or what you've, what you've been experienced? Well, that's the, here's the thing. I don't even know what you, I, that's, I was going to ask you all the same thing. Do you all have a six hour day? Do you do all, I'm not really sure. I know a lot about the Spain system, but I'm not really sure about your system. I mean, I mean, we, we, I mean, probably our only experience is what we've grown up on by watching on telly. Of the US system. So, um, but I think there's a lot of similarities because obviously the content that you share is is very relatable. Obviously, there's a few differences in terminology. So, you know, administration for us is uh, the lovely ladies who normally work in the office, um, welcoming the, the parents and that sort of thing. And obviously, recess, we just call it break time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, and and well, lockers. <laughs> what about lockers? Did, like, what age did children get lockers in school? That, uh, we get lockers in school in high school. That when they're uh, ninth grade, which is uh, 13, 14, Do you all have those? Yeah, we, we we didn't have them when I was at secondary school, but they got them when you were there, weren't they? Had them. I, well, I, all I remember is there was a kid who was a lot smaller than I was, and he used to fit in the lockers. So we used to have a lot of fun. <laughs> we used to have a lot of fun with that. I didn't really use my locker for anything else, to be honest. In there. Yeah, and I didn't think about the fact that you all, uh, you know, anything that you all see from our educational system is, is you know, from TV. And I do think that it, it portrays it a lot. Um, uh, I think probably the big difference in, in what um, you guys may not realize um, is a lot of times what's portrayed on uh, TV are the bigger cities like New York and Chicago. Um, whereas in a smaller city, Lexington is even big, but you know, where I was at in Paris, you know, there was one elementary school, one middle school, one high school. And so those situations are very um, family oriented. Everybody knows everybody. The teachers had everybody's uh, kids. And so it's very small community. Um, and then, but a lot of times what's portrayed on TV, you know, are large, huge systems in Chicago or New York. And, you know, there's a lot of differences in there, but, um, what I think is, is so great is I do think, I know there's discrepancies between, um, you know, the success of students in the United States versus UK versus Africa. But what I just love is that I still think that we're all producing kids that are successful. Um, you are sending us kids. We are sending you kids. You are seeing success. Um, uh, you know, the, these societal areas, the reason people are successful is because of our educators. And no matter what we do and how, you know, in Spain, they don't do a six hour day. Uh, you know, they don't do manipulatives. They don't have the math computers. They don't have class dojo and all these fun things that we have, but yet they're producing successful students um, in what they are given with a whiteboard and a, and a, and a marker. Um, and so that's again, a testament to educators is that, you know, from, uh, you know, in Haiti where I've been on mission trips before where they have 50 kids in a room with a whiteboard, those kids are being successful because of the dedication of the teacher um, uh, and so, you know, I think that's the similarity that we all have, the hard work teachers are having and the success that our students are having. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is, it, 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 I can't imagine, I couldn't imagine teaching without the access to the technology now. I'm so sort of, ingr that's so, uh, such a big part of my teaching. Like if I was just yeah. a mark and a whiteboard, I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> well, do you, all, do you all have discrepancies within schools? See, we have that too. We even have that within my district. We've got schools that have so much more technology. Oh yeah, much less community. So do you all have that too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. It can it can differ massively school to school as to because I 
because so I work part time as a teacher in my school and then I do training in schools all over the UK. So I can go into a school where, you know, every child in the, in the school has got an iPad each. Then I can go into some schools where they've not got anything um, right. still winning on, running on like Windows 95. So that, again, massive discrepancies there as to how much uh, technology is available in certain schools. Yeah. Well, and, and how sad is that, that those two schools are held accountable to the same things uh, and, and the discrepancies. And we have kind of an odd situation here is that we have a lot of money for our low income kids. And so if you are at a low income school, you get extra funding. And so then they look at a school that's high income and go, oh, well, you've got all the parents that are, but, uh, you know, but they don't have the technology because all of our low income schools are all one on one technology. Every one of the kids has a computer. Well, we don't have the funding at the higher income schools. So it's just, it, you know, that, that type of disparage, you know, even five miles down the road or kilometers, I think that's what you all use, you know, five kilometers down the road, you've got one school where every kid has a computer and one school five miles down there that the kids have nothing. And it's, you know, a little bit yeah. scary. Again, dedication of the teachers that yeah. are kids. You're, right, you're absolutely right, though, because it, ultimately it all comes down to the teaching anyway. And um you know, I go into a lot of schools where they have all got this technology, but it's not really being used effectively. Then you can come mm -hmm. across some schools where, because the teacher has a passion for it and is is willing to try, they can have a few devices, but be using it for incredible teaching and learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing that we can agree on with with all the schools is no one can say that the Wi-Fi is amazing. Yeah. because in, yeah. in, in every single school there's definitely going to be that time that your lesson's ready to go you're all set you open the internet and it's just nah no yeah. connection you know that happened with ours on day three um uh, coming to the school year day three the the district's internet shut down and all these kids were there and we had one school where the teachers were uh, you know i don't know how you all work this right now but our teachers can either choose to teach from home um, and a lot of them, if they have kids who are doing that, or they can go to school, the internet went down in the school. And so the teachers were all teaching on Zoom. And when the teacher dropped out, it made the first kid that logged on the instructor. And also had the kid. And when it went back up, the teachers were trying to come back in and the instructor kids were not letting them on. <laughs> Classes of 25 kids with a leader and the teachers trying to come back on. Like, I'm not letting her back on. And. I mean, that's what we deal with with that internet. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Oh, I mean. amazing. Yeah, like uh, you always say that to children sometimes, don't you? Oh, are you, are you talking while I'm talking? Do you want to come up and teach the class? And yeah. they finally got that opportunity on Zoom. <laughs> there you go, took over. Now, do you all have buses or are you all neighborhood schools or everybody walk to school or what's that? Yeah, we, I mean, we're, we're fairly close. I mean, secondary, when you go to secondary school, you might get a school bus. Um, but for primaries, it's, it's very, it tends to be local. So it's either parents dropping them off via cars or walking, that sort and of thing. And how many kids are, 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 are like in the average at schools? So in my school, we've got about 550 children, uh, which would be sort of considered quite a big primary school, uh, two form entries, so two, year, two classes per year group. There's like levels in there. So like one form entries, what would you say, Lee? About 200, maybe yeah. 150, 200. Then yeah. you've got two form entries that go up to like three, um, four. And then you've got the kind of three form entries that can approach like five, six, really, 100. How many kids are in one of your classrooms? Um, 30 is usually the solid amount, isn't it? Yeah, thir well, it's, it's legally you can only have 30 up to age seven. And then after that, it can be flexible. So where I am, you can have up to like 36, 37 in a class. Wow. That's, see, there's a big difference right there. We have, um, most places have a, a, a cap of 24 right. um, until third grade, which is uh, eight years old. And then um, we don't get into the 30s until we get to middle school. Well, I don't know what y'all call middle school. We have elementary, which is kindergarten, five-year-olds to fifth grade. And then our middle schools are six, seven, eight. So how, and old, our high schools how, old, are how old is grade six? Sixth grade is, let's see, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 12 and 13. Right. A, young, a 12 year old would be sixth grade moving on to in there. So kindergarten, I don't think you all have kindergarten. I think that when, because what happens when we have somebody come over from UK, they'll say I'm in the third grade. 
um, they're actually in the second grade because we start kindergarten. So kindergarten's our first year and then first, second, third, fourth. Um, and when they get to sixth grade, they been, it's their seventh year uh, of instruction. Right, so that, yeah, so we, we will have reception, which must be the, yeah, so we have reception year one, year two, up to year six, then they leave at the end of year six. So that'd be the, the same, wouldn't it? Yeah, so kindergarten is reception. I think so. But you do three years of it, did you say? Say that. Yeah. So kindergarten. Well, we, reception is just one year, and then it's year one, year two, year three. Uh, okay. Yeah. Year six, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a, your reception is our is our is what our kindergarten. And we've dropped down. Um, one of the good things about the United States is they put a lot of money into uh, even before that. So we've got three year olds and four year olds coming in, uh, especially the low income students um, and the struggling parents. They are being offered preschool. Um, that a lot of our public schools actually have. So yeah, we have we have a similar thing. We call it nursery. So it's, oh, nursery. Uh, yeah, it's just different. <laughs> Same thing, different names. Yeah. Um, now, what do you call? What do you when a kid gets a drink of water at school? What do you call that? Uh, a drinks break. <laughs> drinks break. Yeah. No, what's, what's the actual thing that they're using to get water called? Uh, a tap. <laughs> <laughs> we, call it, we call it the water fountain, but I've always heard it's been called a bubbly. Do you all call it bubbly? No. No, no. Never never like, heard of bubbly. If, if we were sending a kid to get bubbly, they'd be having a glass of champagne. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, go to the bubbler. It's a water fountain for us. So yeah. um, <laughs> So what 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 we like to ask our ask our guests is what they were like at school. So what would you say it was like teaching a young Jerry Brooks? Uh, it was bad. I was a, uh, I was all about being popular and fun. Um, I, you know, I probably had the ability to be a straight A student, but uh, I was all about friends and all about being the class clown. Uh, you know, I was student government president. I was always, you know, tried to be popular. Um, so, you know, I was one of those ones that needed a teacher that understood that. Had a lot of teachers that didn't understand it and was miserable. Had a lot of teachers that were. So, you know, I was that classic kid that's always goofing off, always in trouble. Um, you know, I could get away with talking nonstop and still hear the instruction and, and be, you know, pull a, a good grade in there. So I was just kind of the class camp clown, always trying to be popular, uh, even through high school, um, you know, kind of the same way. Didn't, didn't really matter about grades as long as there was something fun to do on the weekend, um, just kind of barely getting by, which I think is probably the same personality I have on social media. <laughs> we sound we sounded exactly like the same the same student there apart from when you said I could talk as much as I want but I could take the instructions in that's where I differed I was I was a bit of a class clown interested in mates and stuff and then and in primary school uh, I had a girlfriend for two years which was a very long time during primary school wasn't it Lee um <laughs> no goes on about and, uh, it <laughs> it's because it's so true. I mean, who, who holds a relationship down for two years at 10 years yeah. old? I mean, it's fast. That's, pretty, that's um, pretty good. You should have nailed that with a, with a, right there. You could have married her in 10th grade. That's right there. <laughs> I think I gave her one of them gummy rings, but then I was got a bit hungry, so I took it off her and ate it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm going to nail down this relationship with this ring. We're going to be, now, do you find yourself relating to the students that are like, that were like you more? Oh, uh, 100%. I mean, there's, there's been a few children that I've had in, in, um, the past few years and th this is the thing I, I feel like I'm good at my job not necessarily because I'm not the cleverest um tool in the shed or whatever you say <laughs> uh, but I will um I can get on a level with the children I can I can kind of understand where the frustrations are coming from because I had the same frustrations uh when I was and like you said about finding a teacher I mean I had a few teachers who because uh, me and my brother went to the same school so he kind of had all the same teachers that I had but he's older than me, obviously. Um, <laughs> and uh, he had all the same teachers and they all loved him, absolutely loved him. And it was kind of a bit like, is he really your brother? <laughs> About me. Um, and it wasn't until one, uh, I had a teacher called Mr. O'Brien who came in when I was in year four. So I would have been about eight. eight nine. And uh, he was the only one who, who kind of said like, you know, he just kind of got on a level with me told me what he wanted, trusted me, gave me time, understood my kind of needs um, because I was diagnosed with ADD, um, which wasn't diagnosed until after I'd left primary school. So all the kind of, you know, concentration problems I had was obviously down to that. But it's like you say, like with, with teachers, I'll forever be grateful for Mr. O'Brien because he was the one that kind of 
just had patience and he let me be a class clown, but then kind of just had a little quiet word, not in front of the whole class to kind of show me up. He'd just say like, just calm it down. You're getting a bit of an, you better be yeah. annoying now. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'd be like, yeah, right. Fair. Well, we all need that. We all need those different personality teachers. And, you know, we have, and that's one of the things I think administration needs to be very careful about too, is making sure you're placing students with teachers that are going to understand and love them. Um, and you've got those teachers that understand that, then you've got those quiet teachers in there. But yeah, I had that too. And I, you know, my ADHD was not uh, diagnosed till as an adult. I take medicine now. I can't imagine with it not, but uh, I'm, I was the same way. You either had a struggling teacher that was right on top of you that didn't appreciate it. You felt like they hated you or you had a fantastic school year because you had somebody that understood you, allowed you some reins, but pulled you in. And so that's great that you're able to do that too with the kids that you're dealing with. I mean, was there any particular teachers from your childhood that you still uh i mean would say it was a massive influence on your career and what you absolutely yeah well um uh, miss phoebe miller was in high school i she i had her um for a couple of years probably ninth grade and 10th and 11th she came to one of my events and um you know she was one of those teachers that saw potential she was the one that said to me you need to run for student government which is what ended up me going to the college that i went to and, you know, she got me in ninth grade and said, you have tremendous leadership potential. Here's the things you need to do. Um, I was not involved in any sports. And she says, that needs to be on your resume. You need to go out for diving. You would love that. And you also need to do tennis. And so she took a personal interest in me, continued that through. Um, you know, and I still have a relationship with her today, still message her. Um, and I think that's, that's what it is, is. I think it's teachers seeing potential in kids and helping them to be able to recognize that. Those are the teachers, you know, I remember a lot of different teachers and a lot of fun activities that they did, but I think the ones that really and truly um, uh, make an impact on your life are the ones that long-term see a potential in you, encourage you through that, understand where you're going through that. And, you know, it was a huge blessing having her in my life all through high school. Oh, amazing. Yeah. It's, and and I'm, I'm sure she loved the fact that, you know, you've, you've kept that relationship going and to see how successful you've been able to, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if, I, if, if you're this way. I still just see myself as a normal person. Yeah. I don't know if you see yourself as a celebrity, but if you know, I'm I, amazing walking through an airport and somebody recognizes me and they want pictures with me. And that same there, when I went back to my high school area and I did a big, huge event there, she was there. And I just, you know, I felt amazed and honored to be at my own high school talking, but yet they were just thrilled. Like I was some kind of you know, superstar in there. So it's, it's very interesting just relating to her and her, you know, and her even saying, I'm so proud of where you're at and what you've done with your personality in there. And I still struggle with the, the notoriety uh, on social media, um, but it's just good to be able to go back and have that relationship with her and saying, you're doing absolutely fantastic, but you're still the same kid that I taught in high school. So, <laughs> yeah, amazing. So, um, so on the, on the podcast, we have sort of like different features where we talk about different things around school like one of the features we have uh are like the random things you only find in in school so you know is there anything that what would you say is like the most random thing you don't find it anywhere else in in the world apart from in schools what would you say what is there anything that comes to mind it's just completely random that you you won't find anywhere else you mean like a physicalness of it or like something that, about the job or what, what do you can can be either a lot of the time it's sort of physical things so we have Oh, what have we talked about in the past? Uh, there is, there is, there is PE pumps, like uh, the meter rulers, the big kind of large rulers, um, the overhead projectors. They're a bit older now, aren't they? Um, yeah. yeah, just, just basically, like you said, glitter, like you know, the glitter that gets everywhere that the cleaners want to absolutely have a massive go at you for whenever you get it out around Christmas. Absolutely. Well, and I love to just put a video up there that it, that only a teacher understands, like character character stuffed animals, like a Pete the Cat stuffed animal, or you know, a, a, and and again those those characters that we all know, you know, Clifford the Big Red Dog. Do y'all know Clifford the Big Red Dog? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I remember the cartoon. See, they, they, those types of things that that again in here, and I'm sure you guys have those same things that. When you see something like that, you you it, it brings you back to what you were in elementary school. My favorite thing that I found in school uh, was a hair weave. Um, somebody had ripped somebody's hair weave out, and it was all crumpled up, and the kids thought it was a rat, 
and so I had this big, huge thing, and and they were all the teachers were away from it, and they called me out there, and I got a stick to poke it and pull it up, and instead of it being a dead rat, it was a hair weave <laughs> that um, up there. So and my favorite thing that we don't have anymore are metal slides. Did you all have metal slides on your recess field? Uh, not really. I mean, it depends on the school. Again, some schools have some equipment. Some schools just have. Yeah, we used to, we, we've got plastic slides now, but when we were growing up, we had the metal slides, and when the sun would come out, they would just fly, and your legs would just burn, and you'd get off there and have red marks all the way down, and get to go to the school nurse, and so you're only going to find those in elementary schools, that is for sure. Yeah, um, what about pointless things? That's another one, like pointless things we either do or we see in school. I've got a feeling it might be the uh, the tests you have to sit. The, say that again, the what? The tests that you were saying before that you have to say. Yeah, well, there's a lot of pointless things in it. You know, I think it's pointless that we do observations every day. Our district requires it. I, you know, I, I'm thinking, why do I need to be in there every day? Those are pointless assessments, I think, are absolutely ridiculous. I personally think it's, it's, it's worthless to turn in a lesson plan um, uh, because I'm in the classroom every day. And so we need lesson plans. But to me, it's worthless for them to turn them into me because I'm actually, what I want to see is observation. Anybody can do a good job writing a lesson plan. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people can't teach that way. So I think one of the biggest things is the reliance on lesson plans and turn this lesson plans in and, and look over it because what I want to see is, is good teaching in the classroom. It's just kind of ridiculous that, that, that that's the kind of accountability that we have. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you there. I'm not a fan of, I just think it, it, it's, it's what works best for the teacher. Some teachers like to have everything down, you know, to the to the questions they're going to ask whereas some teachers can do it on a post-it note and it can be absolutely just as yeah, good great things good. now do you all have drills and you all have fire drills and all those those uh drills in there that's what i think is kind of worthless because i'm 52 and i've never seen a fire at any school but we do every single month we have a fire drill a hurricane drill a tornado drill well not hurricane tornado drill um unfortunately now we're having um live shooter drills which yeah. is this it can be but i always was amazed at the fire drills uh growing up and now we have to have them once a month i'm thinking that's absolutely ridiculous and overkill that we're dragging all the kids out in the middle of the snow in order to practice a fire drill that we've not i've not seen in 58 years of, of education is that one drill do you have to do a fire drill uh tornado a live shooter once a month or just one once a month we do once a month on all of them we, we combine them together so while a fire drill they do a fire drill we come outside then we come back inside the tornado drill is where they um they duck and cover in the hallway so we do that right away um the the intruder um uh drills are a little bit more intense they happen at a different time and that, you know, that's, you know, you hate that we have to do that, how stressful yeah. it is. But I'm just amazed. I'm thinking, you know, one time. And, but here's the bottom line is, if there's a fire, everybody's going to get out of the building. I don't care if they're running down the hallway screaming. I just want them out of the building. <laughs> uh, waste that much instructional time on a monthly basis is, is just crazy to me. Yeah, we uh, we had a fire drill at my old school. And we were under the kind of, it was a bit like, you've just got to get the kids out, orderly fashion. And all of this so it was i don't know what it is with fire drill days they always seem to be one when it's horrendous weather and it's freezing mm -hmm. cold like you said and it's just kind of like right guys orderly line let's go let's go and mm -hmm. all of us are walking out no coats on all the kids are stood there freezing the head teacher rocks out with a full-on coat on and a cup of coffee <laughs> and we're just like hey come on yeah <laughs> fully I was and, and you know we deal with kids that that we have a lot of special education kids that don't deal with the alarms do y'all have an alarm that goes off yeah yeah just this big huge alarm and the kids are screaming and it's i'm just thinking do it once and that go go on from there it's absolutely crazy yeah yeah i mean it is that does sound a bit overkill i mean I think we might have it once a term, if that. Yeah. So like okay. Once between maybe September and Christmas. Absolutely. And, and they've, they've gotten to the point where they'll come in and, and they actually judge them and they score you as to where you're at. And uh, now with our lockdown drills, the police will come um, and they will do a surprise one. And again, I mean, how stressful is that to the kids? Get them no talk and be under there for 30 minutes while the police beat on the doors. You know, it's just, it's crazy. Absolutely, yeah, crazy. So, um, what about the most disgusting thing you've ever seen in school as a teacher? Well, that's an easy one. Uh, we had a kid, um, uh, we call him the 
pooper that um, pooped in the urinals, and every day he would poop in two or three urinals. <laughs> and we finally had to set up video cameras outside the um, uh, the um, the bathrooms, obviously not inside the bathrooms, but outside the bathrooms, and then start getting a time frame as to when it happened. And it took about four weeks of him pooping in urinals. Um, until we could figure out which kid it was and call the parent and say he's got to stop doing this and he just thought it was fun to be able to put a little poop in all three urinals in, in the bathrooms and he would go to a different one the next day and a little bit of poop and all three urinals just disgusting that sounds that like that sounds like a netflix documentary waiting to happen doesn't it <laughs> netflix presents the pooper and it's just be going through all the tapes is he doing that one again <laughs> i mean was it was it one one trip and like just a bit, or was it? it was one trip. It was a little here, a little here, a little there. One trip. Oh, and wow. we have, as you know, like at ten o'clock, all of a sudden we got a call. Somebody's pooped in the urinals, and the next day it would be somebody's on the intermediate, and it's eight o'clock, and we have to figure out who was in the bathrooms. You have to stop the teachers. You can't let the kids go anymore. You have to go as a group. I mean, it was like it was like a detective show trying to figure yeah. out. What did you, did you have a big board in your office with all the lines going up? <laughs> and doing right today it's nine o'clock. Today it's eight o'clock. Let's check it. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Ugh. Oh, funny. I mean, like like I say on our podcast, it's all about sharing funny stories. I mean, what would you say is your go-to story that you still tell now, and it gives you a giggle of of something, just anything that sort of. So yeah, my favorite well, yeah. my favorite story was uh, doing. We have Colorado Line, you know. We have um, we have 19 buses that take our kids home, but we still have about 200 kids that came out there. And um, one day I was at a Colorado Line. I love Colorado Line because you never know what you're going to get. And I went up to a parent, and and when it gets snowy, uh, we have all the teachers out there, and they open the kids' doors so that they don't slip on the ice. And I went to grab a parent's um, a van door, and when I pulled it, she screamed no. And her van door was broken off, and I ripped the entire van door off of uh, the, the van. And there it was on the ground. <laughs> and, um, all the kindergartners were calling me Superman because they thought I literally ripped the van door off. Um, and they have a video of it. Exactly. I mean, and it, it's the best video ever because, you know, I'm not even paying attention. I just grab it and I pull, and literally the entire van door comes off right behind me. And it looked like I had ripped the van door off. It, you know, it gave me street cred with the kindergartners yeah. so all the way up through there. Do you remember that? And they bring it up all the time, all the time. We had a chicken come in one time on a bus in a backpack. Uh, worked out uh, at a smaller, in a small country um, school. We had a kid that brought a chicken in his backpack, got it all the way to the classroom, hung it up, and the teacher got about 15 minutes into teaching and kept hearing something and opened it up, and there was the chicken that was in the backpack. I mean, you know, you can't. You can't write this stuff. This is what happens to us on a regular basis. We had a, a snake come out of the toilet on a teacher, come up into the, you know, out of the toilet while she was sitting on it. I mean, you just, it, it's a day-to-day -day basis of fun and excitement at a school because that's just, you know, it's just real life. It really is. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Um, so I know you've done some work as, a, as an intervention specialist. Uh, I think we call it it's sort of like school improvement partner. Um, I mean, if you were in charge of education, I mean, what, what changes would you make? What would be the big sort of changes for you to improve education for the better? Well, I think the big thing is, is taking away those assessments and taking away those, you know, like you said, the scoring, um, that scoring system. And I think that we need to, uh, you know, everybody needs accountability. Um, if we didn't have accountability, we'd be a politician. Who wants to be a politician? But we all need accountability in our schools. Um, and so I, you know, I would really want the accountability to see how the students are progressing and, and working successfully, not on one assessment. Um, and so that's the big thing. And I, I think that we need to give more autonomy to our teachers. Um, you know, I don't know how it is with you all on curriculum, but the district will come down and say, this is what everybody's teaching. Well, the students at this school don't need it taught that way. The students at this school need it taught a different way. Um, just because of, of their experiences, their background, their parental support, um, and unfortunately, where we're at, they'll come down and say, this is your math curriculum and everybody's teaching that way. Um, and so we've taken away teacher autonomy. Um, so I think that we really need to be able to give teachers, you know, back that autonomy to be able to do what they think is best in the classrooms, their experience in there, and let them help the students be successful with that autonomy rather than constantly telling them what, um, what they need to be doing. Yeah. I mean, I think we've got a bit more flexibility in that way. Obviously, we have a curriculum to follow. 
but there's a bit more freedom as to how you deliver that curriculum based on different approaches and, and different right. ways. So, um, I mean, I'm quite lucky in my school is in that we, we are given that opportunity to be a little bit more creative and put our own stamp on things as long as we're then getting the curriculum sort of covered. So, right. Yeah. And that's what, that's, that was always my philosophy. Teach the way you think is best. As long as your kids are being successful, then I'm not going to touch that. Yeah. But you have administrators that say, we're all going to be on page seven. And in eight days, we're going to be on page 16. And that's where you need to be. And you can't do that in education. You pull that autonomy away. And, you know, your gift in this is technology and, and, and what you're doing there. And, I, you know, I just think that we have taken away that autonomy to teachers. I think it's very, for them to be strapped to a curriculum and teach it this exact way is very detrimental to education. Yeah, I, I agree with completely. So, um, we're going to wrap it up, but just before we do, we're going to, because um, like we, 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 I don't know about Adam, but I'm really interested in those differences between the UK and the US, because like I say, our only real experience, it's been great to speak to you and get uh, an insight into what it's actually like, because, you know, our, our understanding was just what you see in Hollywood or what you see on the right. TV, and I'm sure it's very, very different to that in, in reality. Um but I mean, in the UK, we have we have these sort of universal truths in in, in schools, and we've sort of touched upon this. Um, so I'm going to just read through a couple and see if they're the same in the US. So these are things that, things that every teacher will sort of agree with or sort of go, yeah, that happens. Um, so first one, wet play times or wet recess. Do you have that if it's really bad weather, the children stay in? We call it indoor recess. Yeah. Indoor recess. That just will ruin your day. Oh gosh, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and here it's funny, you know, that the the, um, the climate is so different everywhere in the United States. Uh, where we're at, if it gets to be thirty two degrees, we don't get to go outside in the winter, and so they're stuck inside for days. Um, you know, when it rains, indoor recess is literally the worst thing. For and and here's the thing, they know. They'll know the night before and they'll start texting each other about how mad they are that the weather's going to be tomorrow and they're going to have indoor recess and all this. They absolutely hate indoor recess. You all call it wet recess? Uh, wet, yeah, wet, wet play. play. Wet play, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, funny. it's funny with wet plays because we'll come into school and it'll be it'll be looking dull outside. I mean, we, we've never had the glory of having to call like a too hot play. Like, I don't think we'll ever uh, be at that position, but we'll come in. And the kids, it'll start kind of drizzling and the kids will be like, is it wet play? And then you kind of like, well, we'll have to wait and see. And then you go out and I'm one of them where I will take them out it, unless it is really <laughs> cats and dogs. But then when it gets too bad and you have to call it and you have to blow the whistle, it's the kids that walk past you covered in rain. We call them wet play for. <laughs> Why are we out of here? Yeah, we're, and we have the heat too. We, I mean, if we, if we get to be 100 degrees, which it is, we have both extremes. 32, we don't go out. 100 degrees, we don't go out. And the teachers, and, and there'll be days where we have seven, eight, nine days in a row where we have wet days, indoor recess. It's miserable. I don't even go to do observations because I'm like, I'm not walking in the room. They're all in a bad mood. Yeah. I'm not, leave them because it ruins their day. Survival mode. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right, so in England, if you're a teacher, wet paper towels solve any injury. Same in the US. Absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've got a video on that. That and peppermints. If you've got the little wet round life saver peppermints, you give them a peppermint, you give them a wet paper towel. I broke my arm. Here's a peppermint. Get back to your car. Here's a wet paper towel. That is absolutely universal, I think, everywhere. Yeah, oh, we don't have the peppermints. No, yeah, but try it. It, it works even better. It works. And if you get little jelly beans before you're going to give an assessment, you tell them it's magic jelly beans that makes them real smart. You give magic jelly beans out. It works perfect. What, what like color are your paper towels? Say again? What color are your paper towels? We have brown paper towels. Is that what you all have? The big, cute rolls of paper towels? No, we have uh, that. Blue in it. Blue, yeah, blue. Yeah, blue, blue paper towels. Okay, so that's really good. Cool. That's pretty darn cool. I'm going to need a picture. See, here's the deal. I need to come visit when yeah. you are in school. I'll do it January, February, once all this lockdown is, and we'll just go through and we can do a video on the differences in schools. Oh, oh that'd that'd be amazing. Amazing. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, I love how someone will be someone will be watching this, and if they leave with anything, it's the fact that we have blue paper towels and you have brown. <laughs> I'm already thinking about a video. I'm already thinking about saying wet reset. What is it? Is it wet play? Wet you play. Like, what do they say is wet play? Because that would be considered inappropriate here. So, blue <laughs> and wet well, play. we had a bit of a joke about wet play because 
what you normally have in a classroom is you have a wet play box of like activities that you can do. And we yeah. said it sounds horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> Completely different meaning if you're not a teacher and someone says, let's get the wet play box out. Whereas as a teacher, you're like, no. Um, what about, uh, right, so cakes in the staff room won't last longer than one recess. Oh yeah, when, I mean, when one of the things that stresses us out is we have we have what we call goodie table day. It's a potluck when all the teachers bring in food, yeah. and so somebody brings in food and you eat lunch. Well, they fight because whoever has first, second, and third lunch comes in and gets all the food, and whoever has fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth lunch gets nothing. Uh -huh. So what they do is they combine classes. So one teacher will say, "Bring your kids over here." They read a book and they all go down to goodie table day and get all the good food and come back and they sit it on their desk. And then eat it when it's their lunch. But yeah, you, I mean, donuts, cake, it's gone as soon as you get it. It's, it's ridiculous. Like, it's like they've never eaten before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you just can't turn it away either as a teacher. If it's there, you, you've got to have it. Absolutely. Right. So people who make decisions about the education system don't have a clue about teaching. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, our Secretary of Education for the United States is not a teacher and has no educational background. I is mean, it, that's, you, is it Betsy? Is it Betsy DeVos? Is that right? Betsy, it's Betsy DeVos. Yes. Yeah. How did you? Yeah. I just see. I just see a name being mentioned, not in a very positive yeah. way. Uh, yeah. She has, no, it, it, it was a really big issue, and you know, it was very disrespectful to the teachers. Um, to say you're going to put somebody in there that has no background whatsoever, that is basically a philanthropist. Her kids all went to private school. And all of a sudden, you're going to be in charge of that. So we have that at every level. We have it at, you know, even at our district level, we have an elementary director that's never taught elementary school. She was a high school teacher, a uh, high school administrator. And so, I, you know, that's part of our job. You're always going to have somebody making decisions um, uh, that, that do not have the right, that don't have the background knowledge to be able to do that. Yeah, I think for me, it's one of the most frustrating things. So within our government, we will have similar sort of thing, educational secretary. They change like the wind. It's like as soon as, uh, you know, it's new season, new, new yes. exec. And it's just frustrating because they've never worked a day in the classroom. They don't have a clue. Again, it's very, they, they come from, you know, private schools. They're just so, sort of out of, so it, like in England last, last week, um, obviously, given everything that's going on with the pandemic, um, we were giving free school meals to children from lower income families or, or my right. Uh, the government last week in England voted against that continuing through Christmas. So it's just during the school holidays, they were providing vouchers for families. They, they all voted against that, including the education secretary, the school's minister and the children's minister. So, you know, it's very tough for a teacher yeah. in England to believe in these politicians <clears throat> who outright voted against feeding the most vulnerable Absolutely. children. Yeah. And that's what we did. So what was the reasoning? Why did they, what was the reasoning behind that? Uh, God knows. They, they're claiming that they've got better ways of, of helping, but ultimately it would have been right. an easy point score for, for, the, for them. Do you know what I mean? It would have been an easy way right. of getting people on side, yet they still... Absolutely. And, yeah. and we've got a footballer for Manchester United called Marcus Rashford, who is basically really campaigning to, to get these school meals. And, and I mean, it's, it says a lot that he's got more integrity than most of the people right. in charge and he's and he's a footballer he's a sports right. star you know it's not really football you know that right when you say football, <laughs> we're not going to open that kind of word he's soccer he's a <laughs> soccer player okay because if he was in football he would have a helmet on some pads and he'd be throwing a, a football on. yeah um, <laughs> right what about school pizza like school pizza school pizza Okay, so we get square school pizza with corn. That's our meal. Do you all have corn with yours? No, we well chips usually or uh, uh, fries. Ch chips as in a French fry that we call French yeah, fries. Yeah, yeah. No, our, that's a that's an ongoing joke, and it's uh, in a lot of my videos. Square pizza, corn, and applesauce. That's that's the meal that they do, and they I know isn't that gross. And then the kids put ranch dressing on it. How gross is that? But yeah, that's an ongoing pizza thing. Uh, they absolutely love it. Oh, yeah. So you do, so you don't get anything else with the pizza apart from corn and applesauce. Yeah, that's that's what the meal is. Yeah, you, you, our meals are, are one entree, one fruit, one vegetable. 
and that's it. So their meal is pizza, applesauce, and corn, and that's it. And they they got they gotten rid of all desserts. So the kids get no desserts. They get no cookies. We can't bring cake in. They don't have any salt. It's the grossest thing in the whole world. <laughs> so, <laughs> God changes. Michelle Obama did that one, but. <laughs> Uh, and last one, uh, in England, glue sticks are like gold dust. Um, you, you ask any teacher, if you want to keep, keep a teacher happy, just get them loads more glue sticks. Is it the same in, ours, in America? Ours is, ours is um, flare pins. You know what a flare pin is? Uh, flare pins. Yeah, flare, F-L-A-I-R, flare pin. Okay, so flare pins, you need to look those up. Flare pins are the end-all, be-all for all, all educators. They come in all different colors. They steal them. They hide them. They, I mean, it's the end-all, be-all. And then ours is whiteboard markers, um, not necessarily glue sticks, but whiteboard markers because they, you know, they dry up all the time. Yeah. So the coveted things in education over here are flare pins because everybody loves them. They collect them. They grab them. And then Expo dry erase markers. Are, are it's I mean it's the end all be all. If you get a stocking a gift from a parent, it's got Expo markers in there. That's a parent that you want. It's an amazing parent. <laughs> amazing. Right. Well, we'll we, we'll finish there. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. It's been uh, it's been amazing. Really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm sure everyone listening will as well. So uh, if anyone listening doesn't follow you, where can they find you? Where where's best to? I'm glad you said that because I'm anxious to see if I can get a bunch of people from the UK that will correct me when I say things around it. Uh, my social media is Gary Brooks Prin, P R I N, like principal. So my Facebook, social, um, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and uh, TikTok are all G E R R Y B R O O K S Prin. So it's all Gary Brooks Prin. That's every social media. I would love to grab some followers from over there. And I really am truly serious that once this COVID ends, uh, that is one of my bucket lists to come over and I would love to come over and, and visit schools and look at the differences in there and then do something with that. Um, but yeah, follow me at Gary Brooks friend um, on any of those social medias. Um, uh, and you know, they're all connected in there. Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you very, very much. And um, yeah, we'll speak very soon. Thank you so much. Top mark. Yes. Thank you guys. So great meeting you guys, praying for you guys in the COVID and hopefully uh, at some point be able to get over there and visit with you guys. Absolutely. Thank you. Cheers.